Hi, I'm Ron Clark again. Uh, so, we are going to talk about step eight here. But before I do that, let's recap what you've done in the last step. Now, you've done very important work with your mental equilibrium. And this is vital. You cannot do the work of step eight until your mental equilibrium is just as firm as your astral equilibrium. You just can't continue. Um, so if you're not at that point, hold off on step eight until you have perfected your mental equilibrium. That's I can't stress enough how important that is, let's put it that way, as you just won't make any progress in step eight, and you will be wasting your time. Uh, the astral, you've developed your astral senses, you know, hopefully by now they are all quite useful to you, um, and you are making good use of them already. And hopefully, you have made uh, elementaries, you have experimented and, you know, found out uh, how exciting that process is. So, that was step seven. Now, for step eight. I'm going to start um, by reading a section from Initiation into Hermetics, and it's fairly long, so bear with me. This is an introduction to um, the astral training of Step 8 called The Great Moment. And it's uh, really uh, the perfect statement of who you need to be before you start working on Step 8. So, he who has arrived in his development to this point has to consider the kind of thinking, mainly the plastical thinking, very carefully. The concentra concentration power promoted by many years of experiments is producing very impressive pictures in the Akasha by plastical thinking, pictures which are animated to a high extent and therefore seek to be realized. This is all of your thoughts at this point have this power. Uh, hence, one should always foster noble and pure thoughts, and endeavor to transmute passions into good qualities. The magician's soul should be so ennobled by now to such a degree that he is no longer capable of evil thoughts or of wishing anything bad to other people. A magician has got to be kind, obliging, and ready to help at any time, to assist by work and deed, to act generously, considerately, and discreetly. He must be free from ambition, superciliousness, and avoid any boasting. All such passions would, re would be reflected in the Akasha, and the Akasha principle being analogous to harmony, Akasha itself would certainly put the greatest obstacles in the magician's way to stop his further development, if not make it quite impossible. Any further rising in a case like that would be out of the question. Just remember Bulwer's novel, Zanoni, in which the guardian of the threshold, nobody else but Akasha, sees the highest mysteries not come overnight to half-baked or unworthy people. Akasha will understand to derange such a person mentally, arouse doubts of all kinds in him, or hold him prisoner by vicissitudes and reverses of fortune in order to protect the mysteries in every possible way. These mysteries will always remain hidden from incompetent persons, though hundreds of books be published about them. You just won't understand. You know, you won't understand the exercises well enough 
to actually complete them if this is the case. Okay? A true magician does not know any hatred against religions or sects since he knows that every religion does have a fixed system which is intended to lead to God, and that is why he does respect them. It is a well-known fact to him that every religion has made mistakes, but he does not condemn it because every dogma is serving a spiritual maturity of its followers. In due course of his development, the magician goes through that stage of maturity where he can see with his mental eyes through every idea, every action, and every deed, no matter whether present, past, or future. And it is quite obvious that he might feel tempted to judge and condemn his fellow man. But by doing so, he would act against the divine laws and create a disharmony. A magician like that will not be ripe enough to make the experience that Akasha will dim his faculty of clairvoyance and Maya will deceive him. He must realize that the good and the bad are entitled to exist and each has to fulfill a task. No sooner is the magician allowed to reprove or to reproach a person with his faults and weak points then he be directly requested to do so. And should he obey such an entreat, he ought to do so with delicacy and discretion. The genuine magician takes life such as it is. He is enjoying the good things and learning something from the bad ones, but never will he hang his head. He is aware of his own weak sides and tries to overcome them, but he ignores any thoughts of repentance, since they are negative thoughts, which are consequently to avoid. It is sufficient for him to recognize his own faults and never relapse into them any more. For this reason, it would be fundamentally wrong to muse on the past or to feel sorry that fate did serve you with this or that disagreeable things. Only weaklings do complain all the time, expecting to be commiserated. A true magician knows very well that impressions of the past may be animated by recalling them to the mind, thus producing new motives for putting new obstacles in the way. That is why the magician lives, if possible, exclusively in the present moment looking back only if the need arise. He will limit to the most urgent any plans concerning his future and keep away from phantasmagoria and daydreaming. Nor will he waste the abilities acquired in hard to veil to give any chance to the subconsciousness to handicap him. A magician works purposefully on his development without neglecting his material duties which he is fulfilling just as scrupulously as the, tack of the task of his psychical progress. Consequently, he will always look himself straight in the eye. He is supposed to be modest, and as far as his development is concerned, discreet. Since the Akasha principle ignores time and space, acting permanently in the present time, where the concept of, concept of time depends on our senses, the magician is advised to adapt himself as much as possible to Akasha. He must acknowledge as representative of the great moment of now, thinking and acting according to it. The end. <clears throat> Yeah, so if that doesn't describe you, don't continue. It's really that simple. And I'm saying this now because this is really important. This is really serious stuff. Step eight is a whole nother leap in your development. And it is critical that you have all of the past work fully completed and fully mastered before you continue. There's no rush. 
You have all the time in the world to prepare yourself for this work. Okay. So, <clears throat> step eight is about mental wandering, which is a critical art for the magician. Uh, must be in command of the art of mental wandering. It's essential. Um, and in this step, we will begin mastering the fluids. Here is where, where the um, mental equilibrium is most important in working with the fluids. This is like a different dimension uh, than working with the elements or the vital energy. This is fire and you can definitely burn your fingers. Um, burn yourself very badly uh, in this work if you're not prepared. But if you are prepared, it's fairly easy work and uh, will definitely take your magical practice to new levels. Um, and then finally, um, in the physical section, again, this is uh, elective work, um, he talks about um, magic using the elements in a very physical way. Um, so, we'll get to that in a minute. So, <clears throat> mental wandering. The thing that distinguishes Barden's method of learning mental wandering and astral wandering, which comes in the next step, the um, thing which just distinguishes it is that you are every time, well, in every exercise, every time you mental wander, no matter where it is, you have to go back afterwards and verify the veracity of your perceptions. Um, you have to work until you have reliably accurate perceptions. And you go, you do that by verifying, going back and walking around the same place you walked mental wandering with your regular physical body and physical senses and see if what you saw, what you perceived, is actually there in the way that you perceived it. So you keep working at it until it reaches that level of perfect veracity, you know, absolutely clear accuracy, clearness in your perception, uh, no delusion in your perception at all. So, you start in small steps, um, well, let's go through the exercises and I'll explain. The first couple of exercises are meditation exercises which sort of prepare you for your first experiences of mental wandering. And they have to do with the mirror. Um, you sit in front of a mirror, look at yourself, and then close your eyes and try to visualize the image of yourself that you have just seen. And you do this until you can visualize very accurately uh, and, you know, down to the little details, uh, your physical appearance in the mirror. And then, after you've been able to do that with visualization, it should be very quick and very easy at this point, um, then you sit with your eyes open in front of the mirror, looking at the image of your reflection in the mirror. And then you transfer your awareness into the mirror of the, the reflection in the mirror. So you are then looking back at yourself from the mirror. Okay, you get that? You're inhabiting with your awareness your image in the mirror. So that you're looking at, the, looking at yourself, your physical body, and the room behind your physical body from the perspective of your image in the mirror. Okay, so <clears throat> this gets you adapted to the act of looking at yourself from outside of your physical body. 
And this is often difficult to achieve. It's strange how it is, but... Um, so, now we get to the actual mental wandering itself. You want to start with a med each session, you want to start with a meditation that it is your mind who sees, your mind who hears, your mind who fe feels. This is a familiar meditation from, because of past work, but now you're asserting that again, affirming that fact that it is your mind who acts, who, who perceives through your astral and physical bodies. Then we come to the um, <clears throat> the wandering <laughs> itself. What it is, you close your eyes. You're probably closed already from this meditation. And now you simply step out of yourself. You, if you're sitting down, you stand up and stand in front of yourself. But you're, you're not standing up with your physical body. It is with your mind and your creative imagination that you stand up and you leave your physical body sitting down or laying down or whatever position you've chosen. So, the first part of this is that action of standing up. Um, that shouldn't be very hard at all. Just imagine that you're standing up. Turn around and look at yourself. Now, this is a little more tricky, at least it was for me, a little more tricky than it sounds. Because it takes a special concentration to be able to turn around and look at yourself. It's easy to turn around and look at something else in the room, but to turn around and look at yourself, it takes a little extra effort. Anyway, so that's what you do. Turn around and look at yourself. You know, try to see yourself um, as you are physically in the moment um, with as much detail as you can muster. Okay? And then you enter your body again. You know, after a while, just stop it by entering your body again and you're sitting there in your physical body. Be sure to open your eyes, maybe rub your face. You know, make sure you're fully into your physical body. And look at yourself in the mirror and judge, you know, how accurate was your perception. If your perception is accurate and you can comfortably turn around and look at yourself for as however long as you want, then we can move on to the next exercise. Now this time, you stand up from your body, you stand out of your body, and instead of looking at your body, you turn around and look at all the contents of your room. Just look at them, don't go over to them or anything. You just want to look at the contents of your room. And then re-enter your, re your body, and then get up and check, you know, was your vision of all the things in your room accurate? And keep doing that until it is accurate. That your perceptions, when you're standing in your mental body, outside of your physical body, match the factual reality. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the mental perception in this state is a little different than seeing things with your physical eyes. Because what is communicated here is the meaning of things. So you will receive that information as you're looking around at the things in your room, which at first can tend to distort things or make things change while you're looking at them. But, you know, that is not factual. Things are factually not changing. But your perception of the meaning in your 
uh, mental visual perception, uh, the meaning will some you'll sometimes get carried away with the meaning, and the visual impression will change because of that. But you have to fight that. You have to let the meaning be there, uh, sort of low key at this point, because it's not what you're trying to perceive. You're trying to perceive the factual, physical reality with your mental eyes, and that's all, okay? So, beware. That is one of the reasons why it doesn't appear factual. It may be here that you are letting the meaning distort the images um, by following the meaning instead of just following the factual, physical uh, thing, object itself. Okay, I hope that made sense. Okay, so once you've achieved an accurate perception by looking around, um, the next time you will stand up out of your body and walk around your room. Now, this walking movement is again something that's going to take your control. You want to move at a normal walking pace. You don't want to fly off or float around your room because you want this to again be a physical, a perception of the factual physical world which you can't do if you're floating around and getting into that mm, it borders on fantasy you know you want to physically well essentially you want to walk slowly around your room don't get carried away uh, and perceive everything and come back to your body and then verify your perceptions again until you know keep doing that until your uh, perceptions when you're walking around your room are factually accurate okay then the next steps so we're taking little steps at each time and getting used to each one and you have to do it this way. Otherwise, your mental wanderings will be all about delusion and fantasy. Um, so, the next step will be to step out of your body, walk over to the door of your room, open the door, and walk out the door, and start exploring uh, the confines of your house, or whole apartment, whatever it may be. Okay, so, and then you come back to your body and then later verify your perceptions and keep doing that until you have accurate perceptions. Now, the, it will take obviously less time each time to have an accurate perception. So, you may find that the first time you walk around your house, your perceptions are perfectly accurate because of the work that you've done with verifying up to this point. And each time you reach that verification of accuracy, it enables the next, next step to be that much easier, simpler, and accurate, okay? So then, the next step is to step out of your body and then walk through your house till you uh, get your front door, go out your front door, and just walk around the neighborhood. You know, you don't want to walk too far because you want to be able to go out afterwards and verify your perceptions, okay? Now, once you get used to walking around outside, you can go a little further, you know, maybe go to into town, <laughs> you know, uh, you, it becomes less important that you verify the accuracy of your perceptions because by now your perceptions are accurate. Okay? But it doesn't hurt. If you can, go out and verify. Um, but at some point you're going to have to let go of that step and rest assured that your perceptions are accurate. Okay? You've 
reach that level of maturity at this point. So the next big step was start with a different meditation and it's the meditation that you are not bound, your mind is not bound by time or space. It is capable of going anywhere, anywhere, and any time, past or present or future. Time is not a barrier, space is not a barrier, your mind is totally free. That's the beauty of the mind. You're free. You're not bound by this body. You're not bound by this moment in time. You always have to come back to this body and back to this moment in time. But the mind is not bound. It can, it's free to explore anywhere, any when, except that it always has to come back. While you are incarnate, and alive in this body, you come back to this body. If you don't come back to this body, you are no longer physically alive in this body. It's as simple as that. You can't get lost uh, because you will always come back to your body. Okay? So, having done this uh, meditation for a bit, it's an affirmation, really. Uh, and uh, it can be done in the Akasha. It uh, is much more powerful if you do it in the Akasha, just like we did with Mastery of the Elements. Um, so, at this point, you leave from your body, you might step out of your body, and then go to wherever you want to go. So, the first time, Pick a place you want to go. It will help you originally initially if you have some idea of what that place looks like. You know, with Google Maps these days, that's a pretty easy thing to do. Um, and then, in your mind, just be there instantly. You, it doesn't take you time to get there because you're not bound by time. Time is not an issue. You can, in an instant, be on the other side of the planet. It's that simple. And you have to just let yourself do that. It should come very easily. You are just instantly uh, tran your mind is instantly transported to this other place and explore it until you're content and then just as instantaneously return to your body. You can return to standing in front of your body and then re-enter your body or you can just of your own volition come back into your body and just as easily leave from your body instead of standing up and then leaving, but whatever works best for you. Um, yeah, it's that simple. So, once you reach this, this stage in mental wandering, explore, you know, see what the world is like, what it's about. Uh, the explorations in the mental body will show you a level of reality that most people don't experience when they visit a place. Because with your mental eyes, you will see into things. You will understand things. You will comprehend them. Because you will be able to see their meaning. You will understand the meaning of different places, different people, different times if you want. But for now, we're not going to worry about other times. We're going to just travel in space to other places on the planet. Okay? And when you feel you have explored enough, 
um, you can visit the moon, the actual planet, uh, the moon. You know, you can visit the actual planets in the solar system or outside of the solar system. But we're talking here the factual planets, not the spheres. That's something different, but the actual physical planets. You can explore the universe if you want. And, uh, and remember, you, you have the eyes that understand, that perceive meaning. Okay? So, it, it's a big universe. It's a very, such a variety of life in the universe. It will astound you. Um, and you can also begin to experiment with looking in on events of the past and looking in on events of the future. Um, not that that is very useful to do, um, really. There's not a lot to be gained from doing that, um, because the past is the past. <laughs> You're not going to change anything that ever happened in the past. And the future, hey, it just hasn't happened yet, so you're not going to change anything that happens in the future other than what you do right now in the present moment. So you're much better off spending your time in the present than in the past or the future. It may be entertaining, but that's about all. And then Barden goes on to talk about wandering the higher spheres. And this is a bit different, and this is not really something that is included in step seven that comes later. Working with the spheres, it's a, a much higher work, basically, and takes different techniques than simple mental wandering. Now, mental wandering will serve you, I mean, I just can't imagine at this point um, life without mental wandering. Uh, it would feel too confined, too narrow. Um, you'll find mental wandering much more useful than astral wandering. Um, there's places you can't go with your astral body. Just can't go. Uh, you can cause the same effects with the elements and the fluids um, with only your mental body as you can with your astral body. In the astral body you can have a much quicker uh, necessarily effect on the physical and astral planes than with your mental body alone, but again that's mostly a function of your degree of mastery of the elements and fluids. So, that, ah, uh, I also wanted to say uh, something on my own here, uh, it's not in, in Barton's book, but, um, working with the projection of the mental body, you may find, and this is something that I, I've found at this point, is that you can split your awareness into several parts. For instance, I can be talking to you right now, but with my mental body I am actually standing behind the camera and looking at myself talking to you. Or I can be all here at once. So, it's possible to split the awareness between actions, you know, sitting here talking to you and standing behind uh, and doing this other thing. Um, I could be stand sitting here talking to you and at the same time uh, projecting a large quantity of the fire element. You know, I can split my attention and accomplish more than one task at a time. And this, for me, 
arose as a consequence arose as a consequence of the projection of my mental body because I discovered in doing that that there are varying degrees of uh, connection to my physical body when I uh, mentally project um, I can project my awareness and still be conscious of my physical body or I can project my awareness to such degree that I am totally unconscious of my physical body and that made me realize that part it's it's like you know as it's uh, uh, described or visualized in many places there is a cord connecting my mental body to my physical body and that cord can be fat and there can be a lot of communication between the two or it can be really thin very fine cord and you know my uh, mental body is completely autonomous has no sensorial or conscious connection with my physical body and that is up to me um, in the beginning when you're mentally projecting you might find that you know you're feeling all of your physical body while you're doing this or that it's only slightly diminished just be aware of the fact that that is up to you the quality and quantity of that connection is directly within your will you have the, the power to you know cut that off almost you'll never cut it off completely as long as you are an incarnate being and this is what pulls you back to your body is that connecting cord okay so you know experience it play with it take control over that aspect of mental projection you know how much do I want to still be connected to my physical body okay. so that's the mental exercises of step eight and it is a major work it can be a very long work uh, depending on how far you want to take the explorations in the later stages of mental wandering you know and whether you need to include them here in step eight or whether they just belong to you know your your not step work but just regular life and what you might want to do okay so now the astral work again you've got to have perfect elemental balance the solid solid elemental balance of the element you know, balance equilibrium <laughs> excuse me equilibrium of the elements it's got to be absolute <clears throat> okay one thing I should this is all about mastering the electric and magnetic fluids and this is very important work because your work with, well, for me, working with the fluids pretty much supplanted work that I do with the elements and the vital energy because the fluids sort of cover it all. Uh, anyhow, and they're very powerful. So, in the English version of Initiation to Hermetics, I don't know if it's true for the you know, the original German. Um, Barden writes that the electric fluid comes from the fire element and the magnetic fluid comes from the water element. Um, but this is not factually correct. Uh, the, the elements are born out of the fluids, essentially. The fluids are this higher level of manifestation than the elements. The elements come out of the fluids in terms of sequence of manifestation. Um, 
But what Barden is really referring to here is the method that he is suggesting for learning to manipulate, well, to accumulate and manipulate the elements. So, by his method, what we use is a very dense accumulation of the fire element surrounding us, which then presses the elect or the fire element surrounding us, which then presses the electric fluid into our bodies. And same with the magnetic fluid. We create a very dense accumulation of the water element around us, and that presses the magnetic fluid into us, and we accumulate it within our bodies. Now, or conversely, we develop a intense accumulation of the element inside of us, and the uh, the fluid starts to surround us and starts to accumulate on the outside of our bodies. Now, it's, it's sort of a, an alchemical process with the element. If you have a dense enough accumulation of an element, you want to keep compressing it and making it more and more dense, at a certain point, at a certain point of density, the fluid begins to sweat off the uh, element and accumulate on the outside, on the surface. So, he is using that accumulation of the fluid that occurs naturally when you compress the element that is the source of the fluid that we are drawing from, drawing our accumulation from. Okay? So, he presents four methods um, by the inductive method, which is like I said, you are a hollow, completely hollow vessel, and around you, the universe is filled with the fire element. And the fire element gains such a density, so dense with the fire element, you can only barely withstand it. And that presses the electric fluid into this empty body that you have presented. And you just go with it and let the uh, electric fluid build and you develop an accumulation of the electric fluid in your whole body. Then, when the time is right, you dissipate the fire in the universe, hold on to that accumulated element for a little longer, I mean the accumulated fluid for a little longer inside of you, and then you release it the same way. And you practice with that until it's very easy for you to accumulate the electric fluid in this way. Okay. Then, it's the magnetic fluid with the same inductive method, where you know, you empty vessel, you surround yourself the universe of water elements, and you compress that water element around you till it's almost to the point where you can't stand it anymore, and then the magnetic fluid presses itself into your body. It naturally forms as a result of the compression of the water element and travels into your body. And you let that build and build so you have a nice accumulation of the magnetic fluid in your whole body. Then you release the water element hold the fluid in there for a little longer, and then release the fluid. And again, you do that until it is easy for you to accumulate the magnetic fluid. So, you have both of these fluids. You've gotten used to filling your whole hollow body with them both. 
And then we'll turn to the deductive method. Now here, you are, instead of accumulating it out, the element outside, you are accumulating the element inside. So fire element into such a strong accumulation. You're bursting at the seams. And when you have achieved just that right density of accumulation, the electric fluid gathers on the exter external, the exterior of your physical body. Your whole body becomes coated with the electric fluid. And then you release the element, holding on to the fluid on the outside of your body, and then you release the fluid. So, you do that until you can easily generate the electric fluid in that way. And you do the same with the water element and the magnetic fluid. Till you have all of these ways of accumulating um, the fluids under your belt. Now, the inductive method, where you're accumulating the fluids within yourself, you will use the fluids, when done in this way, for yourself, affecting you in whatever you're doing with the fluid at that instant. It is for just for infecting, affecting yourself. The deductive, where you're accumulating the fluids externally, is for use externally. <laughs> For, uh, you, you accumulate in this way to use the fluid for someone else. Okay? So, that's fairly straightforward. Accumulated inside is for using it on yourself. Outside is for using on other people. So, the next thing you will do is you are going to fill the upper half of your body with the electric fluid and the lower half of your body with the magnetic fluid. The fire and air regions of your body go with the electric fluid and the water and earth regions with the magnetic fluid. So you accumulate by the inductive method the, f the um, electric, no, first we start with magnetic fluid. Accumulate by the inductive method the um, magnetic fluid in your body and push it down so that it inhabits just the abdomen and leg area. And then you, with the electric fluid, you accumulate by the inductive method the electric fluid in the upper half of your body, the air and fire regions. Okay? And you stay like that for a while and then you release first the fire fluid, I mean the electric fluid, and then the magnetic fluid. This is very much like we did before with the elements in each of their quadrants. It has a similar effect, um, but much more powerful effect on you um, than working with just the elements then, okay? So, we've done that with the two halves of the body, the, you know, top and bottom. Now we're going to do it with the left and right. So, we fill the body with the magnetic fluid and shunt it all over into the left half of our body. And then we fill the right half of our body with the electric fluid. And stay like that for a while. And then release the electric fluid and then the magnetic fluid. And do that until you're comfortable doing that. That has a similar effect as doing the two halves. But similar, it's different. You'll find out, it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> now, we want to do something similar, except 
once we have these two halves of our body filled with the fluids, we're going to take each fluid into our hands. We're going to take it out of our body and run it down into our hands. So that whole quantity of fluid is in our hands. And then we do this opposite, the same thing with the electric fluid. So, our hands are now filled with the electric fluid and the magnetic fluid. And this is what we use in hands-on healing. These are the magical healing hands. And you, you will be able to do wonderful things with these hands. Okay, that's basically the work with the mastery of the fluid. And you need to be able to do gymnastics with these fluids in the end. In other words, you will very quickly um, uh, generate the accumulation of the fluids. And by any method, you will probably come up with your own methods. Just like we didn't need the breath, to accumulate the elements, we don't need the body to accumulate the fluids. And I suggest that you experiment on, um, experiment along those lines. Once you have accustomed yourself to doing it this way with through the body, start experimenting with just accumulating uh, the electric fluid or just accumulating magnetic fluid from the universe. Okay? So, the uh, physical exercises, um, uh, he, he talks a little bit about influences through the elements and they're very simple element magic. Uh, uh, common in pagan and indigenous traditions. Uh, they're, you know, burning something for the fire, letting it evaporate, ev evaporate for the air, mixing it for the water, letting it decompose for the earth. And he, you know, suggests simple rituals to make use of these properties of the elements and this way of sending the elements uh, out to do your will. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, the, the big difference between what you find in, in, in at least pagan traditions, modern pagan traditions, is our mastery of the elements. You know, we're really dealing with the actual factual fire element as we do this ritual. Um, so, that makes a big difference. And these rituals are quite powerful. Um, but they're very elementary um, uh, magic. Um, then he talks about fluid condensers. Um, and by fluid condensers, he means the electric and magnetic fluid, or the elements. Um, and there's a liquid and solid condensers. And this is... Uh, great knowledge to have, great experience to have working with fluid condensers. They're very useful in all kinds of operations. Um, making an elementary, for example, using fluid condensers in its construction works very well. Um, so there's lots to experiment with there and have fun with. And then he ends with uh, um, preparation of magic mirrors. And this is a fun little section. It's, it is very entertaining and very useful um, to make your own magic mirror and then treat it in these ways to make it useful as a magic mirror. And he's going to talk about this a lot more. And I think it's the next step, step nine. Um, so, these are all <coughs> interesting um, you know don't really take much effort and it's, it's, it's handy handy knowledge to have so again don't skip over it 
if you can take the time for it. Okay, now I marked this down for one plus years. And <clears throat> it really is that way. There's no telling how long it will take you to um, master the uh, mental wandering and, and fluids. Uh, it could, can be very quick. You might have a natural ability uh, for mental wandering and a natural ability with the fluids. And if you do, that's great. But take as much time as is needed to truly master these exercises. Yeah. Okay. That's it for step eight, and I'll see you at the end, and we'll talk about step nine. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>